So welcome everybody. I am Bunny Ellerin. I am the uh, president of New York City Health Business Leaders. Um, and this is our second in our series of, um, of virtual events and discussions where we talk about issues that have resulted as a, uh, from COVID and it, particularly how they are gonna impact New York um, and folks going forward. And so um, the topic of mental health, uh, there's no topic that's more um, you know, evident from both COVID and all of the other um, events of the past several months. So what we decided to do was put together a, a panel of folks who could address it from multiple vantage points. So I wanted to uh, get started with our guests. I'm gonna briefly introduce them. They are then going to introduce um, themselves, you know, talk a little bit about what they're doing, and uh, then we'll get into some Q&A. So I am going to, um, un well, each of you should unmute. Um, so today we have um, Gil Otto, um, who is the CEO of Rubicon MD. We have Summer uh, Malik, uh, who's SVP of Genoa uh, Psychiatry, and formerly the CEO of One Doc Way, which Genoa acquired. So um, Summer had a great exit. Um, and Rena Pandi, um, who's the Chief Medical Officer of Able To, and uh, who's been a longtime friend. All three of these folks have been longtime friends of New York City health business leaders, um, as well as the whole New York City scene. They also are all friends together. So I think it's going to be a really nice discussion. It's a very hard topic, um, but I think you'll get a lot out of the discussion. So first, um, Gail, just tell us a little bit about Rubicon and also who you touch um, in the equation. Is it patients, physicians, both help, you know, who you touch? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, th thanks for organizing this. Thanks for uh the opportunity to share and thanks for everybody who's joined. Um, <clears throat> so as mentioned, I'm the uh, CEO and founder of a company called Rubicon MD. Uh, we're a seven year old health tech company on a mission to democratize access to medical expertise. Um, we do that with a really simple platform. Um, we enable primary care clinicians to get opinions from specialists or what we call e-consults. Um, they come back in a couple hours um, and they facilitate better access to specialty expertise um, in the community. Um, and what we've found is that more than half the time, it uh, avoids the need to go send, send somebody to an in-person specialist visit. Um, we're a clinician-facing tool supporting primary care clinicians. We support about 6,000 clinicians across the country. Um, we're a venture-backed business, as with our um, friends here. Um, we've raised a little bit over $40 million to date. Um, we're based in New York um, and we cover clinicians across, uh, currently we're uh, within 37 states across the country. And I want to add before we go to um, Summer, you raised money during a pandemic, <laughs> right? Gil? Oh, me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you raised money during a pandemic. Um, it's pretty amazing. So I would say um, the way I would position it, and was what I've told people, it's better to be lucky than good. Um, we were actually planning to go out and do some uh, fundraising this summer, and we just um, happened to get um, early interest beyond what we kind of expected. Um, an incredible group, um, Deerfield, and a, a dear friend and mentor, Julian Harris, stepped forward um, to lead our round. So and it closed in February, and then, you know, the world turned on its axis in March. So um, we didn't plan any of that. It's like I said, better to be lucky than good. Well, I'm glad you were lucky. Yeah. Summer. Yeah, uh, thanks again um, for having us, Bunny. Thanks for putting this together. And thanks to your organization for the past eight years for being a Ten. leader. 10 years, Ten. Yeah. Uh, eight that I've gotten to be a part of it. Mm -hmm in That's being right. a leader in bringing these forums together and really you know making new york a healthcare epicenter when i first met you it was not right it was maybe you me and seven other people and now look at what we've got new york has yeah. really come come of age in the in the healthcare environment and 
your leadership was part of that. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, so to, to those who are attending, my name is Samer Malik. Uh, in 2011, founded a business called One Doc Way that was focused on improving access to psychiatric care for the uh, underserved communities across the country. Uh, we've been growing that business for the past nine years. Today, we are the nation's largest provider of outpatient telepsychiatry services. Uh, we are now called Genoa Telepsychiatry as a result of an acquisition. We focus on, Bunny, to your question of who we serve, uh, treating the Medicaid population. So we're primarily partnered with community mental health centers, federally qualified clinics, uh, and integrating psychiatric care into those care settings where patients are already receiving supportive services, case management services, and primary care services. The complexity of patients we see is typically more complex, often dealing with SMI, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, and most of our patients are on multiple medications, multiple uh, med management courses at once. Uh, in 2018, we were acquired by Optum, which is gonna be the common thread uh, for the three businesses here, uh, and are now building out this business inside of Optum. We're based in New York City, uh, offices in Midtown, but once upon a time, uh, Gil and I shared an office down in Soho, must have been like 2012, 2013, in the most early of days. So those are some back. best days. <laughs> right? Where are those days now? Yeah. Was that part of Blueprint? We were both, uh, you were you were a Blueprint company, right, Gil? And we were renting space right next I to you. I was both. We were first renting space and then we became a Blueprint company. That's so, wild. Yeah. All right. And Dr. Pandey. Hi, I did not share an office with these guys, but we are, uh, we're, we're fam, feels like we're family. We've known each other a long time, so it's fun to be on with you guys. Um, so uh, I am, as you mentioned, Bunny, Chief Medical Officer at Able2, New York, New York based company, uh, close to Penn Station. So proudly kind of started our footprint in New York City now over, gosh, over a decade ago, um, which is hard to believe that we've been around that long. But we're a, we're a provider of, like, like Summer, we're a provider of behavioral health treatment programs, um, all tech enabled, all virtually delivered. Um, over the years, we've really built out a suite of clinical programs from more digitally delivered treatment to more human, though tech enabled treatment and everything in between. Um, and the patient population that we serve is one notch uh, lower in severity than what summer's population will be. So we actually don't do those with severe mental illness, but just about everybody short of that, um, up, you know, as high as severe major clinical depression. Um, and we really started off and cut our teeth in patients with comorbid mental health issues alongside physical health issues. My background is actually as a cardiologist and I saw firsthand in my clinical experience, um, pre able to how common it was to have coexistent behavioral medical health issues and how much uh, you know, depression, anxiety and other mental health challenges were a barrier to doing all the things we were trying to do on the physical health side. Um, that was where we started, but we've expanded that footprint to treat you know, many more patients with behavioral health in need. A um, couple other points, I guess, just to remind the audience, um, the listening group, uh, we're national. Um, we've been national for many years and we have licensed providers in all 50 states. And who do we serve? I mean, we work most closely with payers um, and their employer partners. Um, we're a provider, so we work obviously very, very closely with their employees or members who are our patients. And we oversee very tightly the care that's being delivered to make sure it's evidence-based and very high quality and very outcomes focused. And then I would also throw the provider in there as our constituent uh, key, key stakeholders. So we have a national network of 800 or more now growing. Um, and it's very unique for behavioral health providers, right, to be part of a network where they have oversight, where they're part of a team, where their work is delivered as a protocol against evidence-based guidelines. And I think that's unique and um, actually a wonderful experience for them, to, I think, to be part, part of the able to family. Uh, there's probably more parts of the story, but I'll, I'll pause there. And All right. Elements. Well, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, so I think it's, it's pretty obvious. We've seen study after study after study um, about the, the fragility of the population at all levels, um, all age groups and, um, you know, and certainly all demographics and um, whether it's anxiety, depression, um, loneliness, isolation, fear, uh, there's a lot of it going on. And with those who've never experienced it or, and for those who have experienced it, maybe more severe. So 
I'm curious what each of you is seeing or has seen as a result um, both of COVID and then obviously um, the, you know, the um, highlighting of, you know, racism and, you know, what's going and how that, how COVID has impacted that and magnified the, the problems in our healthcare system and overall. What are you seeing? So, Summer, maybe you're the mo you deal with the most severe. So, what are you seeing? Uh, I really appreciate us leading with this question because while COVID can be an overwhelming experience in this moment, as the poll kind of showed right now, um, we can't forget the racial injustices that exist in our country that are explicitly manifest and often compounded in the mental health ecosystem. Uh, so explicitly what we're often seeing is a lot of the safety net clinics we are working with are most under-resourced when they are serving underserved minority communities. It's really unfortunate that, that those who have the least are also being served with the fewest resources. There are structural drivers to that. There are policy drivers to that. Uh, we have taken the, the forthright step of, step of trying to serve those clinics in the south side of Chicago, in Compton, in certain parts of Miami, in, in the Bronx, uh, and try to improve access in these communities. From our perspective, and the beauty of telehealth is it that you can use it to be non-discriminating. The same psychiatrist that is supporting patients in Westchester can support patients in the Bronx, and that's powered through telemedicine. So we're, we're trying to live up to that virtue of just because you live in an underserved community doesn't mean you only have access to underserved care. Overall though, uh, quite unfortunately, 70 to 80% of these clinics serving the underserved, serving minority communities are, are woefully understaffed or, and are typically unable to support the needs of their community, resulting in uh, community members, uh, black, brown, and, and everything in between, uh, resulting in poor health outcomes, more trips to the emergency room, and to be frank, further stigmatization of mental health. Uh, when you don't have adequate resources, when you don't have people having conversations about mental health treatment, it often goes undiagnosed or unacknowledged, only resulting in worse outcomes down the line. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I, I think um, certainly everything that Samer is saying is the same things that we're we're seeing and feeling. So our purview with Rubicon MD is that we are at the clinical level. So we see we primary care clinicians are the users of our platform, and we cover 120 specialties and subspecialties. But what we're <clears throat> we see about 10 percent of that is um, uh, behavioral mental health. Um, conditions um, specifically coming through our platform um, and so I think there are a few a few elements of this I'll, I'll try to break it out so first is kind of the um, the COVID um, COVID change and what happened through COVID so um, I think for what we've all seen happen now is COVID hasn't impacted communities um, it's not its impact hasn't been um, homogenous across there are clearly communities that have been harder hit um, and those are explicitly black and, black and brown communities, um, and those are vulnerable populations. Um, and so you have this kind of compounding of two things. One is the actual disease and the virus, um, which when you have these comorbidities, when you have greater, um, uh, you're at greater risk, when you're more likely as to be an essential worker, um, all of these things just make it um, a greater hit and impact, um, you can't get away. And then you take that and then you say, well, everybody um, is having their mental health challenge. We're all challenged now because we're in a quarantine. It's not just working from home, you're working from home in a quarantine. And so I think everybody um, is having a uh, strain on their mental health. And we, we you know, we're all on this call because we think there will be, there is and there will be a mental health crisis in this country. Um, that will disproportionately impact people who are harder hit by COVID and who have less resources to manage. Um, and I think Samer raised a really, really, really important point, which is that there is a stigma. Um, there is a stigma that doesn't necessarily uh, exist in the same way in other communities um, that there is in these communities to being able to get that support that's necessary. Um, and so I think we're seeing those things. So 
we've seen a rise in questions related to COVID, but we've also seen um, a broadening of um, the need for behavioral mental health. Um, and I know we'll get to this, but that's part of the reason why um, we went so deep and we announced about three weeks ago, um, a deep suite of behavioral health um, um, solutions and support um, where we've partnered with, you know, people on, on, on this call um, to be able to provide greater wraparound support in these communities because the primary care clinicians can help to a certain degree, um, but you need to be able to provide greater wraparound support in the community. You can't expect patients with these challenges to pick up and travel over um, to you know, New York Presbyterian um, to go see somebody for any number of reasons, and then you add COVID and it adds to those lists of reasons why you can't expect that. Um, and so we're seeing that the same people that are hardest hit are also the same people that will have the greatest challenges um, getting access to these support um, systems and resources over time. And so we think that we need to step in and provide and think through how do you stitch together solutions that provide wraparound support in the community for these um, um, for for these uh, folks who are who are hardest hit, so I think that's what we've we've been seeing. Um, we think that there's um, like everybody on this call um, that you can't divorce um, you know behavioral mental health from physical health um, right now because it's so tightly integrated in the way in which people need to be served. Um, and so we think that this is actually the moment where you have to step forward with a greater set of integrated offerings to help people. So, Rena, you serve a, a, a you serve base, uh, more of an employer based population, right? So, yeah, most of our um, well, it's a it's quite a span now. So, uh, okay. from the commercial to Medicare to Medicaid, now increasingly over the last couple of years. So, we've seen different patterns in different populations. Um, for one, I would echo you know everything that that Gil and Summer just said, and uh, you know we we quickly jumped in mid March, right when when we all went to isolation. To um, we did a couple things. One was because our providers are our providers, we actually manned them, armed them with resources. The, that we thought they would need and that we thought our patients would need to handle the particular stresses that COVID might impose. So it's like the things you mentioned, Bunny. Um, uh, social isolation, uh, you know, just the uncertainty and the fear and the anxieties brought about by the pandemic, uh, the financial insecurities that many faced um, in the wake of job losses and such, um, which added. And then I don't think we anticipated this at the outset, but we wove it in later as we continue to learn and optimize our resources for our providers and patients. The uh, grieving process has been very different very different, right? You, you're not with your loved one when they pass away. You're not grieving, you know, with the funeral in the same way that traditions have allowed us to do with families. So there, there are all these interesting things. And then healthcare workers have been dramatically hit, right? And we have, um, uh, it's been really interesting to look at our data because we collect all our clinical outcomes. So what we what we saw, um, A, was a significant uptick in engagement, of course, right? As, as, as Gail and Summer no doubt have seen too, our census has nearly doubled. People are more adherent. They're sticking through the programs even longer than before. So the volumes are up. Um, higher levels of anxiety and stress, um, more so than depression, which was sort of interesting. I, I do wonder if we'll see a longer tail of the impact on depressive symptoms versus the earlier spike mm -hmm. of anxiety. Um, much higher levels of burnout, which we measure in our healthcare workers. So we, we actually have a New York-based um, hospital system with whom we work. And in that population, we measure burnout. Um, and that has gone up, as you might imagine, alongside higher rates of anxiety. So it's, it's confirmatory. Um, we had some interesting signals around loneliness and social isolation, which we measure in our Medicare population. And in fact, we saw slightly lower, I mean, still very high prevalence of loneliness in seniors who participate in ABLE2 programs, but slightly lower um, in the COVID era compared to the pre-COVID. And we weren't sure why, and we kind of hypothesized that we we're all we're all picking up the phone and calling our moms and dads with more frequency and doing Zoom conferences with family members we haven't talked to in five years. But um, so it'll be interesting to see if that trend persists. So um, getting, Gil, getting back to what you were talking about with the wraparound services, I'm curious about that and how you're working um, with uh, Genuine Able To and so talk about that. Yeah, so um, what we found is, um, so 
one of the biggest challenges that just kept coming up, um, people would come to us and say, you know, how well do you guys support um, around behavioral mental health? And we had, um, we have a deep panel of psychiatry and deep panel of um, psychologists um, that provide opinions into primary care. And we've always offered that um, um, as a support service. Um, but what we found as we started to you know, kind of peel back the layers um, is that there was really a need to be able to say, I have a patient with this type of condition, help me understand how to manage and support them in the community, particularly because in most situations, there isn't an ability to just, you know, connect them to, you know, a therapist up the street or to um, a psychiatrist for them to engage directly, um, help me to create, stitch together kind of a virtual suite um, of solutions that can help uh, manage that patient. And there were really two pieces of it. So one, we found and we heard that uh, most of the clinicians on our platform felt um, that they were less comfortable um, managing mental health than they were with the physical health piece of it. Um, and so there was kind of a lack of, and I think that's owed to a lot of the training in our, in our system, which doesn't attribute enough um, and doesn't provide enough education on how to manage this piece of health um, historically. Um, and then the second piece was even when they found and figured out that there was an issue, there weren't enough resources to be able to manage. So providers said they were almost afraid to ask the questions because then there was the kind of so what piece of, I got the answer, now I don't know how to provide a resources to support this patient who's having suicidal thoughts or these things. And so there wasn't a kind of clear set of available resources. Um, and a lot of people have gone and just started offering these to patients. We found that for particularly these vulnerable populations, that doesn't work. Um, because it requires when you put the onus on the patient, it requires a level of education and engagement. Um, and it assumes a lot of things about ability to take time off work to try all these other things and factors that explicitly aren't necessarily the case in these populations, which end up being the highest cost and the highest need. Um, and so we said that there's an opportunity for us to go and find best in class partners um, and put together um, a set of wraparound things that allow for deep support um, for anybody that walks in the door um, in one of these community health centers with behavioral mental health conditions. So um, we put together a set of upfront screeners and diagnostic tests, which allow people to be able, prep clinicians to be able to better um, stratify their patient population and understand um, whether or not they're at risk and their issues. And we work with psychiatrists across um, some of the leading institutions in the city um, to put that together. Um, and we use accepted um, screeners and assessments. Um, and then we enabled a more agnostic, uh, medium agnostic consultation, which includes now phone consultations. So a primary care clinician can get on the phone with a psychiatrist and they can just dialogue. And it's a much more robust way, um, for, particularly when you have to talk through a patient that might have severe mental health, exactly what to be looking for and then kind of work through a care plan. Um, and then we've partnered um, you know, with the folks here to be able to provide effective off ramps to the next stage, yeah. which is you've understood the issue, you've um, highlighted it, now you need to be able to do what's, figure out what's next. And so in a very severe patient, you probably do wanna get them directly to a psychiatrist and so a group like General allows you to have a direct ramp to be able to get them into a psychiatry program. And then when you think about the more mild to moderate, um, then that's where you can um, refer them out to services like ABLE to. And so if you think about it as a spectrum, you, all of these are kind of the key off ramps depending on how you stratify that patient based on their risk. Um, so it's been exciting. Um, I think again, we're at the point right now in this country where you need this type of wraparound support. So we've heard um, really, really, really positive um, uh, reactions from folks who, who felt that they needed it. Um, and I think we're um, hopeful that this will start to um, help those communities that need it the most. Yeah, Bunny, I'm just gonna piggyback on what Gil's saying. Um, and it's funny, like from your vantage point, Gil, it's wraparound. From our vantage point, it is the suite. <laughs> like, well, we're we're actually also we're coming at the same problem from slightly different vantage points, right? For us, it's we're seeing the spaces exploded. There's a plethora of solutions, and I think it's hard for clinicians 
patient, the primary care docs, it's hard for the patient, it's hard for employers, it's hard for payers to, to sift through all the solutions. And so I think folks like us are, are putting thing, putting the pieces, the puzzle pieces together um, because it's complex and it's not a one size fits all. And, and those folks who are kind of going, oh, I realize behavioral health is a problem. Let me pick a solution. No, like that, that won't, that isn't going to solve it, right? You know, it's very complex. It is a very heterogeneous collection of conditions. There are varying intensities of interventions that are needed, varying modalities by which those interventions could or should be delivered. And I think the onus is on folks like us to, to help frame for our, our partners how to put the puzzle pieces together in a suite of solutions and kind of come together to help solve the problem, which is what many of us are doing. Um, even within ABLE2, we're kind of putting some of our own puzzle pieces together, right, from the digital end of the spectrum to more moderate programs to more intensive programs, and then working with, you know, folks like you guys to, to cover the pieces of the puzzle that we might not be, um, be, be making available just yet ourselves. One thing the, the last three or four years has perhaps shown all of us is that mental health is, is big. And there are a lot of ways to approach mm -hmm. it. And the three businesses represented here represent three different approaches to mm -hmm. it. And I think the corner we're turning most recently, especially with our, our common thread in Optum, is trying to figure out how to make all those touch points uniform from a patient experience perspective, right? Mm -hmm. We have spent years in this space, and now we understand the nuance of how to approach therapy versus self-directed care versus coaching versus medication management. If you're struggling with mental health, that's a lot of nuance that you're not ready to unpack or able to even learn. So our ability to create uniform experiences, tucking Genoa into Rubicon, tucking Genoa into ABLE2, and creating a patient experience that is singular but comprehensive, I think is the next generation of where we're going to go in terms of mental health evolution now that we recognize how big of a, a space it is. Yeah, and some are, you know, Gil, you mentioned the primary care docs, you know, to their great credit, have tried for a long time to manage mental health issues. And, and it's tough, right? And I think they would probably be the first to acknowledge, as I would as a physician, I didn't know, I don't know what's the right next step a lot of the time. Is it psychiatry? Is it, you know, therapy? Is it a psychologist? Is it a combination? Is it med only or med plus, right? Um, that's, that's, that's actually hard. I mean, that, that it, it's a lot to put on the shoulders of the PCP or any clinician, and certainly on the shoulders of the patient to have to pick and choose which is the right path for them. If we docs don't know, how do we expect the patient to know, right? So I think if we can streamline, you know, Summer, as you're pointing out, and have an entry point and then be able to do the hard work up, we experts of where to guide a patient for their most optimal next step to get the best outcome. Um, that, that's, I think, where we're all headed. So this all presupposes that people have access, right? <laughs> they um, have some sort of coverage or they pop, can, or their employer's paying for it, or maybe they can pay for it. Medicaid is the largest payer, right, of behavioral health services, maybe. So, Access continues to be a really big issue. Um, and now there's a whole new population that needs it. Um, so this is sort of a two part, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on, you know, have, has COVID opened more access because are more payments there, number one. Um, and then number two, telehealth was the breakout star, right? of uh of COVID-19 and so that potentially provides more access if you can get to it so I maybe a little convoluted but the whole idea of access um how are you dealing with that sure um COVID um has certainly increased demand for mental health services that's unequivocal. We see that from the claims data coming in from Optum. It's kind of known societally. Your poll was an anecdotal piece of evidence, right, where 30-some percent of respondents identified something that was deleteriously affecting their mental health. So demand has increased. But fundamentally, the problem we had before COVID was there is inadequate supply in the marketplace. And COVID did not create new supply of therapists or psychiatrists or nurse practitioners into the marketplace. What I think that has done, which is really good for Gil and Rena's business, is it's created 
tension around what are my other channels to accessing mental health support? Can I access it through primary care? Well, now Guild's business gets this great tailwind to support mental health within the primary care setting. Or can I find mental health support through digital therapies, through coaching, through asynchronous communication that's much more scalable than one-on-one -on -one video conversations, which is where Rena's business and able to has so much uh, to gain from, from this moment. Uh, my hope would be that because we're only accentuating and expanding the access problem, further imbalancing demand and supply, uh, the market starts to recognize other channels for access to care mm -hmm. that aren't just live two-way uh, interactions or videos, but start to get creative around where else mental health can be. So. That was a, a softball tee up for Gil and Rena to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I'll, I'll start Gil and pass the baton to you subsequently. Um, yeah, I mean, they, it's such an interesting time. And I do think it's interesting your point about telehealth being kind of a breakout star. I mean, we, we all were kind of doing remote virtual work well before this and it, you know it's, it feels like sort of the world has caught up to us and our secret knowledge that this is a way that you can deliver very high quality care and see very good outcomes and make it easy to access for patients so it's kind of nice to see the rest of the world catch up um pay, you know payers have made it easier financially to access right like removing cost share um you know making deductibles not apply things of that nature which have removed some of the financial barriers which has been great it'll be interesting to see where we land up post covid though and how much of those um, regulatory changes stick and how many things go back to the old ways of doing things. Um, you know, the other thing that's been interesting, and this is less an able to story and more of just being in connect, you know, contact with lots of other physicians out there who had to transfer their care to telehealth. Um, I think it's unearthed the places where it can work and the places where it's truly challenging. Um, and the populations that Gil and Summer have already alluded to that are more socioeconomically challenged or in um, communities where they might not have access, it, it, it is not, e there is not equity. Um, it is not the same. You know, I think it was, my husband works at a safety net hospital in Boston as a cardiologist. Um, and there were very evident disparities in access to even mm -hmm. telehealth. You know, when you have mm -hmm. um, half of your panel speaking, a, you know, who are non-native English speakers um, and having to manage translation services through virtually delivered means, added, bur added challenge. So it's kind of unearthed some of the, you know, we thought it was going to be the panacea. And I do think it's also actually given me a kind of step back and said, okay, there, there are populations for whom it's great, populations for whom it's not as great, and there's actually a lot to learn to make sure it's, you know, it's access is, is equitably distributed across the population. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, Rena. I think um, this is probably not the answer you would expect me to give, given mm -hmm. our, our vantage point at Rubicon MD, but um, I think, broadly speaking, telehealth has probably just ex exacerbated the, the disparities um, that already existed. Um, and I do think it, it's a little bit more nuanced than that, but we've been working with some partners around it. I think there's just like a, at a base level, um, infrastructure that doesn't exist, right? So um, Wi-Fi, broadband, you know, just ability to access these things is not distributed equally. Um, as, you know, Rena said, translation services, comfort with just, you know, um, ways in which you access the system. So um, if you weren't comfortable going to um, see a psychiatrist before, you probably, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden when it's virtual that you've all of a sudden become comfortable. Um, and so there are, are a lot of people who just, for which they're historically, they haven't trusted the healthcare system and that that hasn't shifted because of, you know, virtual care. So I think um, there are a lot of things that I think base infrastructure and just access to internet, um, reliable internet, um, safe spaces to be able to have conversations. Um, if you live in a crowded apartment with, you know, three generations um, there, it's very hard to have um, a, a virtual visit um, versus if you can, you know, have a, you know, you know, private room and office or whatever to, to have a separate visit. So um, I don't think that it's, um, it's been distributed equally for, and I think a lot of it is the infrastructure um, piece of it, but I do think that there is an opportunity um, if you can solve for some of those pieces 
for it to actually do the opposite and for it to be an equalizer. Um, and I think a lot of what mm -hmm. we, we as folks are talking about is we're on the, the side of the delivery um, and we feel like, um, I think Samer brought up the great point earlier, you can actually use this as a way to match supply to demand in a way that you weren't able to before um, because you can do it virtually, right? It doesn't matter where um, you sit, um, through the CBT program at able to, you can get access to this um, and you don't have to be able to go physically here or do these things. So a lot of it can just be equalized because you can match supply to demand. Um, and one of the things that we've um, been talking to folks about is um, the pandemic itself isn't distributed um, you know, equally, it's mm -hmm. hyper-local. Um, and so you see a spike in this county or in this area, and then you see a spike there. Mm -hmm. And so what you need to be able to do is take surrounding resources and get them there quickly. And that's what telehealth allows you to do. Um, and then to your other question on, on Medicaid, I think what we've seen and been hearing is um, very similar to what um, Rena alluded to, which is um, a lot of the groups that, um, a lot of the groups in the safety net um, haven't necessarily, and we've been seeing this with our, our partners, um, they've gotten access, they've enabled programs, but it hasn't been as robust as what we've seen in the Medicare Advantage and the commercial side. I think um, certainly, you know, there's been financial coverage, but getting the programs up and running, it hasn't been um, at the level that we've seen in other areas. What can we do to help? I mean, you know, um, there's so many people, you know, everyone on the call, on the webinars in healthcare, I mean, you know, we hear you speaking about this and what I know people want to know, well, what can we do? Is it, you know, is it a regulatory, is it government, is it who, how can we as, um, you know, as concerned people, what can we do to help? We're all speechless. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry. Go ahead, Rena, you first. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and Summer, I know you do a lot of thinking about advocacy and policy too. So um, yeah, I mean, I think some of the things that have changed over the last decade that have brought behavioral health to the fore are the same things that you we need to keep doing, right? I think some of the, um, what's been great is the consumer voice. So this, this acknowledgement that this is an issue. We're all facing it. It's okay. And we need to do better at tackling it. So I think to the extent that folks just continue to be loud about it and talk to their employers, mm -hmm. you know, push for, you know, ask their benefits teams, like, what are we making available? What are our resources? Let's make sure our employees are aware and have access and that we're making it okay for them to access those resources. Right. Um, you know, some of us are pushing, yes, about regulatory stuff or government stuff. Um, some of us are pushing also behind the scenes to to try to sustain some of the regulatory changes that have been made. And so people want to write letters to CMS, um, things like that. Or there's a role for that. So, uh, you know, they've, they've enabled payments. They've, they've loosened um, some of the regulations around payments. And we Can hope you, to be able to. Yeah. Can you talk about, just for people who don't know, uh, during this period, what some of the loosening was? Because there was, it was substantial based on historical. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'll start in summer. Please add in, sure, you, you, you know, as well. I mean, some of it, you know, there've been some, um, it, CMS has been moving in the right direction about making making telehealth more, more easily accessible. But there have been the barriers, you know. You have to be in an originating site, for example, like in a provider's office or in an ER, uh, with some exceptions, like in rural um, areas or um, folks in the recent change last year around dialysis centers and such. But they loosened a lot of that in the COVID era, recognizing that patients couldn't get into a physical location to have access to telehealth. Um, hopefully, some of those loosened regulations will actually persist. Um, Summer, you want, I mean, you, you, yeah. you're actually closer to this than I am even, you want to so add. Four, four main rule changes uh, were enacted in a matter of 48 hours in mm -hmm. mid-March. It's worth noting that these four rule changes were things that this group and others have been advocating for for years. So it's amazing to see how quickly policymakers can act when uh, the issue is urgent enough. So those four rule changes were, and Reno alluded to a few of these, uh, one, CMS expanding the site of care. 
Uh, so previously, you could only deliver telehealth to Medicare patients in facilities that were in rural settings. Now you can treat patients in their home, in facilities that aren't in rural settings, so that's one. And uh, number two uh, was the relaxation of a, a prescribing requirement such that to prescribe controlled medications, you had to have an in-person encounter with a patient first. That was suspended for COVID as well. Relaxation number three were the tools you could use uh, for telemedicine. So typically you had to use like very stringently defined HIPAA compliant tools. Now Zoom, FaceTime, Skype are all eligible service platforms. And then fourth, a whole range of new services were brought into reimbursability to allow for other services that previously, previously were not covered by a telehealth to be covered by a telehealth during COVID. Now, all four of those rule changes were stipulated on the public health emergency that exists directly in response to COVID. So all four of those rule changes have the potential to be undone once we get past COVID and get to the other side. So as Rena kind of articulated, we're advocating for uh, at the Genoa level, at the Optum level, and lots of other people are advocating for enshrining these changes permanently in law so that the benefit that we've been able to derive over these past few months in bringing more access to more people in unbridled formats uh, will persist uh, post-COVID and allow for future innovation. So that's one big piece. But Bonnie, to your, your question around like, what can we do? How do we, how do we advance? Uh, there's so much, right? It's, it's, it's a multi-pronged um, answer. But one thing I'll just call out in specific is engagement, right? So folks thinking about mental health, folks struggling with mental health, really lean into the system, push the system to its limits, because that's how we as business builders learn how to do better, how to build whatever is next. And all the evolutions that our business has undergone, all the evolutions that I'm sure Rubicon and Able to have undergone over the years have been a result of really good engagement from patients asking for more from the system and us responding to, okay, how do we, how do we deliver better and deliver more? Um, so that's a that's a very like somewhat aloof thing to to say. I'm sorry, but like it's it's the consumer push that yeah. will create the um, the next generation um, innovation on its own can't exist without good consumer engagement. Yeah, create noise. Keep creating noise. The noise is being created, but just keep pushing. Right. It's always been this sort of hidden thing that people didn't want to talk about anyway. It's just sort of a stigmatized topic, which is loosening. Still a problem, but. The more we talk about it, the more we realize it is a huge problem. And then I think that pushes employers, payers, regulatory bodies, et cetera, to actually stand up a full toll and yep. do something about it. So just so following uh, the, the discussion today, we are going to do a summary um, and that we're going to send out to everybody. And so we'll collect that and, and encourage people to do that. I want to um, I want to move to some Q and A. We've gotten a ton of questions, um, which also brings me to this. Following today's webinar, we were we're going to have um, a networking event, a networking uh, primarily for. We were going to do it primarily for our members and sponsors, but given how many questions there are, and given like you know how much we could talk about on this topic. We'll open it up to everyone um, who wants to join. And I know Gil's going to be on, Lauren from Jenna is going to be on. So um, Anand will put a link in our chat. Um, so for those of you who want to join after, please do. Okay, so a couple of different people have asked about this big debate around schools and, and opening. I mean, as a parent, um, Rena's a parent, Gil, I don't know, I don't know who, I, I know you're a parent of a little one, Gil. We're, we're all parents. <laughs> what? <laughs> you're, all you're all parents, okay, so. <laughs> Not school age yet, but. Right, 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 right. Um, uh, and Mazel Tov on that. So, um, what, okay, you know, there, the social distance learning has honestly been a failure in a lot of ways for all, for everybody, but in particular for um, certain populations. So how do we balance the need for, you know, in-person learning versus, you know, people keep talking, are talking about the, um, the safety. Um, how are you all thinking about that? 
I, it's I, not I, an easy decision, and I don't envy the folks who have to make this call. Whether you're a parent making the trade-off between optionally sending your kid to school or not, or a policymaker or a school administrator, very, very difficult decision. But my observation is that the narrative is being heavily weighted towards the public health dimensions and not enough people are talking about the challenges in distance learning and where that has failed students. To me, it feels like that side of the narrative hasn't gotten enough play and therefore we may not be able to make decisions with all the facts at hand if we don't understand how impairing this environment is for kids who have to learn from home uh, and try to make things work in that environment. I'm, my, my daughter is not school-aged either, so I'm, I'm speaking only from an observationist perspective. So for, you know, for those of us who do have school-aged kids, I mean, because we're talking about mental health, this isolation, this lack of um, interaction as between, you know, student and teacher also, right? Um, you know, long term, I feel like there are going to be some real, I know for my son, there really are, were some dramatic impacts and I, I assume it's for many. Um, so from the mental health vantage point, are you, you know, are you seeing any signs of that summer? You know, it's a really interesting um, dynamic. Uh, our business is about 30% focused on children and adolescents. Um, but we're not at a place with access where we are sensitive to increases in demand. Our child psychiatry that we have on the marketplace is already fully utilized. So it's hard for us to see, well, what spikes in additional mental health needs may have emerged just from our own data. Uh, now, I can say that within um, uh, Optum, we are seeing a, a generally upward increase in utilization of therapy services by uh, adolescents. Um, what is that uh, driven from? Is that, you know, uh, space and time removal of constraint? Now people have more time to access services, or is it, um, you know, driven by societal and public health factors? I don't know. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you there, Bunny. Though anecdotally, you would you would assume that you know the the stress and anxiety is manifesting in more mental health needs elsewhere. Maybe maybe Rena or Gil, you're seeing spikes in your businesses. Yeah, we've largely focused on uh, 18 plus, so um, so we won't see the the younger group in our own data. Um, I think, um, but I can sort of speak to it personally and friends, right, more than business-wise, you know, the 16-year-old like Bunny does and the 12-year-old. Um, so it's it's interesting. And I think that the, the anxieties that are evoked by, you know, me and, you know, in me and in my friends is, it, it feels a false dichotomy of like school or no school, right? I mean, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to get too. I don't want to get political. But like I think, I think we would all agree this could have to been done better, um, and there would yeah. be a better coordinated response. And I think we could have gone back to school with less anxiety if there were a better coordinated effort to have an approach that was safer. It need not be all or nothing, right? Um, but the kids are the kids are making it work, but they're they're missing, right? They miss their friends. They miss the social interaction. They're finding ways to do it virtually, which is really interesting. Um, in Massachusetts, where I actually live, though able to, we're, we're based in New York, um, we're loosening. And so the kids are starting to get back together and you just see how much they need each other and need that social interaction, um, especially the teenagers. And, and I have friends who, whose kids aren't doing so well um, and who really have struggled emotionally um, being isolated. Um, so I've seen in sort of all versions of it in my, my own personal experience. We have a, a really good question here from um, a psychologist um, about group treatment, um, which she says can be as effic efficacious as individual treatment. Has virtual care considered the group treatment modality? Um, because, well, have they? And there is potential for even wider dissemination of services there, um, especially because there are provider shortages as we've all talked about. Um, so curious. Whether yeah, we're, we're seeing group therapy delivered by a video pretty commonly now. Pre this is one of the interesting ones. 
this didn't exist too much pre-COVID. There weren't that many businesses or organizations focusing on group therapy uh, via telehealth. Um, but COVID really forced uh, folks' hands. And, and so we've seen hospitals doing intensive outpatient programming via video, outpatient therapy services, uh, rehab and detox programs, engaging in group therapy over video. Rena kind of hit the nail on the head. There is a therapeutic effect to being with peers, both in an educational setting and a recovery setting. And that's well established in the literature uh, for mental health and substance use. And so to be able now to use high quality video experiences like this one, where you can still be in a therapeutic session, learn from your peers, support your peers, and be on that progressive journey uh, has really come alive here uh, due to COVID. If the rules aren't made permanent, this is one of the things that would be wound back because typically group therapy was not a, a reimbursed service by telemedicine simply by nature of you're going to do it from your home. You're not going to all go to a facility and do group therapy over video. That wouldn't make any sense. Um, uh, so we will need to see these rules made permanent for virtual group therapy to persist in a broad way going forward. So um, for what we've seen is a slight take on that. Um, so we don't have the direct, you know, patient um, perspective, but I think one of the groups, um, and I think Rena brought it up a little bit, but one of the groups that people aren't thinking as much about are the actual caretakers or not, that should call it the actual clinicians who are managing these patients and their mental health and the, the toll and the effect that the things they are seeing is taking on them um, mm -hmm. and just how well they can continue to manage and sustain um, and how they find ways to, to cope. Um, and so they have, there's one, the fact that this is taking an, an intense toll. And secondly, they don't have that collegial kind of, we're able to just um, sit and hang out and talk to our peers and, and, and have those type of interactions where, that we used to. Um, so we are seeing that people are using this digital um, collaborative um, kind of medium um, to be able to kind of maintain the collaborative nature of medicine and to be able to support their peers. Um, and we see that with you know, mental health and then we've also enabled so you can actually have some discussions um, that are tied to integrated support, right? So you know, I think the holy grail for us all is can you integrate the mental and the physical health together? Um, and so being able to dialogue and have those discussions. And so that's part of um, what we foster um, and part of what we, you know, we think is incredibly important now because um, one of the under discussed topics is the physician burnout that um, is and will come out of this, um, this mental health crisis. Just this past weekend in the New York Times, maybe you saw there was um, a profile of Dr. Lorna Breen at NYP who committed suicide. She was um, head of one of the emergency departments at, I think, at NYP Allen. Um, seemingly had never had uh, problems before. And so the mental health issues are, with our first responders are, are critical. Um, are you seeing um, any specific programs that are being organized for them? Uh, Optum launched a, a website called loveforthefrontline.com, which is meant exactly uh, for okay. this. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so that's something anybody can access uh, as a way to understand what resources are available for frontline workers, and then also participate and, and be a participant. And then. Um, there's one other uh, business that a friend of ours, Adi Siegel, started in New York City. I have to find what it is, but it, it's something in the same vein around okay. sending, sending care, sending love to those on the front line. All right, we'll send we, that out. We've gotten poked by some of our par other partners um, in the New York area, Horizon, um, Blue Cross, Blue Shield of New Jersey actually did a nice job to sort of stand up and go, we want to just proactively make resources available to folks at our WJ Barnabas and Hackensack Meridian and others. So um, they, they kind of proactively recognized that they were going to need, they were going to need support um, and, and reach out to us to think together about how we might make that support available. So um, yeah, there have been folks who have recognized that need and have been very mm -hmm. about uh, making that support available, which is great. 
Okay. Oh, go ahead, Gil. The only thing I'll say quickly is we're, we're working on figuring out how we can structure to be able to offer the same services that we're offering to the patients, um, versions of that to the clinicians who are actually um, supporting the patients as well. So um, we're trying to think through proactively, how can you provide additional support to the actual community that's supporting these, these patients? Well, we have uh, just a couple of minutes left. Um, and so I wanted to end with something positive. Um, given everything that's happened over the past, you know, five, six months, um, it, it can be very, uh, it's, it's daunting and overwhelming. But what's one thing that you are hopeful about for the future? Rena? Um, you know, first of all, I think people are resilient. And I think that's been so evident throughout all this. Um, the other thing is, I think it's been sort of a, re, a re reminder that people need people. Mm. We need each other. Um, and I, 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 if that's the only thing that comes out of this, frankly, that'd be great. Just we are humans. We are, you know, people need one another at our core. Uh, and this was actually a very clear reminder of that. And I think for me personally, um, I'll take that one forward and continue to make sure I, I stay connected. I would just say discussions like this that may not have happened. Um, I think what we've seen, and I'll be uh, very brief here, but I think that we've seen that the industry has moved forward probably 25 years, maybe more <laughs> in the span of two months. Um, and I think that's cause for hope. Like, you know, Summer brought it up, but when a clinician move, you know, travels across the state line from Massachusetts to Rhode Island, their skills didn't immediately go away and they, those patients aren't so different. And so the ability to just say, we're gonna just solve the problem for people quickly um, and groups like us coming together and having one discussions, but two figuring out how can we put together solutions to address these issues really quickly. Um, I think that's been great cause for hope. And I, I've seen so much happen. Like, you know, we've been in this, you know, for a little while now, I think we've seen in two months more happen than we've seen in the previous two, 20, 10 years, whatever you want to look sure. at. So um, I think that's great cause for hope uh, from my perspective. Yeah, you two nailed it. Those are two really great ones. The, the third one I'll add is um, a hope for a more rac racially just society on the other side of this. We really had a, an awakening to some of the injustices that has, has caught on in a way that, that previous eye-opening events hadn't. I am hopeful that this sticks and we see lasting change uh, and movement towards a, a more equal uh, country. Well said. It has been a privilege um, to speak to each of you, um, Gail, Summer, and Rena. This has been a, a tremendous hour. Um, and I thank, I thank the three of you for participating. Um, and I'm hopeful too um, for the all of all of what you said.